Okay. Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. The two biggest influences on my thinking when it comes to philosophy, politics, and economics have been the objectivist philosophy of the novelist philosopher Ayn Rand and the Austrian School of Economics. So they're both subjects that I love to talk about, and there may not be anybody better equipped to talk about them than our guest today. He's the president of the Gold Standard Institute, CEO of Monetary Metals. He's an objectivist, and he's an economist. Dr. Keith Weiner, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's an absolute privilege to have you. So when did you first become an objectivist and what attracted you to the philosophy? Um, I was in college in 1986, so I'm dating myself there. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was, I was aware other people didn't think the way I thought. And um, I took as an elective a constitutional law class as an undergraduate and um, found myself arguing with the professor. Like every case that would come up, they would talk about that quasi-public property. In other words, that you know, if you're the owner of a shopping mall, that maybe you don't have a right to, to have a nativity scene or something like that because it's quasi-public. And you know, completely confused. Of course, the Constitution doesn't say that there's such a thing as quasi-public property. And <laughs> no. it doesn't say that um, quasi owners of quasi-public property may not uh, display religion. It says Congress shall pass no law. Yeah. Right. So anyways, I used to argue with the professor a lot, and somebody came up to me after class and said, you must have read Ayn Rand. And I said, no, I haven't, but you're like the third person who suggested it. So I'm going to go to the student bookstore, and um, the only book they had was Atlas Shrugged, so I picked it up and I read it. And then I, I kind of um, went through and read everything that, that uh, Rand had published at that time in 1986. By the end of it, I said, okay, I found somebody else who thinks the way I think, but she was so much clearer a thinker than I was at that time. I said, okay, I really have to figure this out and understand it. So I became a student of objectivism and where the line is where I think I would say, okay, I'm no longer a quote unquote student, but an actual objectivist, I don't know, but um I was I was always thinking that way even before then, but um, you know, reading what what she said and and making it clear was really the uh, epiphany for me. Sounds like she put into language the sense of life that you already had. Well, the sense of life, but also the, the very specific propositions about property rights, contract rights, individual rights. I mean, it was pretty clear. I could have enumerated. Okay, there should be laws against murder and rape and robbery and arson and you know all those things i was clear on that and explicit but explaining okay how do you reduce that to man's life and what why, why is reason the source of all these rights and that was the part that i needed the uh you know explicit uh you know discussion of and at some point you also became interested in Austrian economics was that around the same time and what about the Austrian theories in particular attracted you so I wasn't really I mean obviously Ayn Rand talks about Mises really as the only economy economist that she really respected she I think she called Milton Friedman poison or maybe that was the term for uh, for Hayek um but I wasn't really studying e economics, right? I was, a, I was a computer nerd. I was a software guy, right? I dropped out of school to go build a software company like, you know, some of my heroes had before me. And, you know, it's, it's learning a ton about software. It's learning a lot about business. I didn't know, I didn't know jack about business when I first started Diamondware in 1994. And then, you know, quickly it's, it becomes an all encompassing, all consuming thing and it's nose to the grindstone. So I sold Diamond Wear, August 19, 2008 was the date of the transaction. And, um, uh, you know, as you can imagine, that was a few weeks before everything started to blow up in the financial system. And oh, yeah. in, in watching that and, and first feeling very bemused, it was surreal, right? I mean, I had just done my transaction, 100% of my wealth, virtually 100% of my wealth was sitting in cash in a couple of too big to fail banks. And at first, I was like, oh, yeah, everything is going on sale. This is going to be great. And then it became clear within a matter of weeks that this isn't great. This is something really, really bad that's going on. Um, 
And so I started to study economics and markets just to figure out how to protect myself without any real ambition to study it per se. I came across this old Hungarian professor named Feketeg. And you know, from the pictures, like oh, he's obviously old. I don't know how old. And I and, and I was explicitly thinking, you know, I, I was I think 13 when Ayn Rand died. And so obviously far too young to have you know known about her or or made any kind of pilgrimage or whatever. It was like, you know, by the time I discovered Ayn Rand, what was it, four or five years later? Um, you know, so anyways, I, I came across his writings and then I saw that he was he was gonna teach a course in Hungary. And um, I said, okay, well, I have plenty of vacation time coming to me and I can't afford the trip. So let me go and actually meet him. I just, I just felt like he was the only person asking the right questions. It seemed like all the stuff I was reading about the financial crisis then and now, by the way, it's the same. Everybody kind of starts in the middle and they're just doing brownie in motion, chasing their tails. You know, it's too much money and, and whatever. It's like, well, okay, but how do you define the right amount? And you know, you run into just weird things. You know, if you study science, one of the first things, like at the high school level, and if you didn't get it in high school, certainly your fr first freshman, real fr freshman class in, in a real science and, uh, you know, freshman, first semester, freshman year, would be to understand when there's an equation, it's called dimensional analysis. You have to look at the dimensions on both sides. So if, if one side, so you see F equals MA, right? So what is mass? It's kilograms. Acceleration is meters per second squared, force must have the dimensions of kilogram meters per second squared in order for that equation to even work. And then in, in money and inflation, what are we told? That's when too much money supply is chasing too few goods. Well, money supply isn't a supply, it's a it's the stocks. It's like total quantity had versus good supply is a supply, it's flows. It's like tons per year or wheat or whatever. Okay. You're comparing two things of two different dimensions. Like at, at, at a most basic, basic, I'll call it freshman science 101, it fails. Okay. So, you know, you look at this and you think these other schools, you say, okay, what is it about the Austrian school? These other schools are not really schools of economics in the way that um, astrology and, and leeches are not schools of studying how the planets work and not schools of studying medicine. Um, you know, to, to, I love the uh, expression from... Um, 20th century physicist Wolfgang Pauli, when somebody gave him a paper and he reads it and he crumples it up and he throws it into, into the into the garbage. And he says, This isn't even wrong. Right? These are these are notions, you know, before Galileo, they thought that um, if you throw a, a rock, it would fly straight until it runs out of force. And then, like, you know, turn a corner, I guess. I'm not sure if they said that explicitly and fall mm -hmm. straight down. All you have to do is get the hell out of your ivory tower. Go into a, a farm field and, and find some kid and say, boy, throw a rock for me. And you'd see it's an arch, right? It's not a straight line. So, you know, anything that says it's a straight line, that's not a science. It's not a school of science. That's just complete rubbish. So um, I came across this guy and started to study under him without that intention in particular. Got, you know, deeper and deeper into it, eventually wrote a dissertation and got granted. It's not accredited. I can never get a job with this as a credential, but um, the work was real anyway. Uh, got a PhD in essentially monetary science um, with a uniquely Austrian flavor and a, unique, a uniquely different flavor of Austrian than what most, uh, you know, running around today. And that's where I think when you refer to the contradictions, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're going to get into that with your questions, but uh I definitely did see that, and I, I came in a different path, and and didn't have those, didn't didn't study those uh, that thinking that led to those contradictions in the first place. Fact, it was very different. So you mentioned that the, the sort of uh, the word I would use is dynamism of the Austrian school, the 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 time element that they introduce, and the, the function of the interest rate, and I found that all so fascinating. And I remember reading Menger's book. It's in English. It's Principles of Economics. I can't pronounce the German Grundsatzi or, or some such thing. But it was so phenomenal. Just when he, he when he broke down value imputation, because all my life I had heard in casual conversation that the value of a, a consumer product is based on how much is spent going into making that product. Of course, the cost of production theory of value. And it seemed common sense to me. 
But once I read Menger and he broke down the order of goods and he explained how, no, it's the exact opposite. It suddenly became so clear to me. I was just like, how could I have ever thought such a ridiculous thing? <laughs> because obviously if the cost of production determined the value of something, you could go buy a bunch of expensive furniture, set it on fire and then sell the ashes, which of course you can't. Because it's the other way around. The people are bidding up the cost of production based on what they think they can get at the end. So, and then the, the Mises's time preference theory of interest, like this stuff was just amazing to me. And, and how the explanatory value of the Austrian theory blew me away. I had previously read Adam Smith and, and Milton Friedman. And, though, and other, look, I'm not going to just completely disparage those guys. I thought that they they did a decent job of defending the free market. But the Austrians was like it was three-dimensional when everybody else was working in two. But the thing that I wanted, there's a, there's a, you know a, a lot of contradictions with the between you know Mises and Rand, for instance, with the a priori status of knowledge that Mises taught. But that's going to be too complex. I don't want to get go too far into the weeds. But Mises taught that all value is necessarily subjective, right? And it seemed common sense to me when I read it. But then Rand turns around and says, no. Value is an objective concept, meaning that things it, that there is an actual value that's equivalent to a fact. And Mises, of course, would say no. And it took me a long time to resolve that. But you said that you really didn't run into that problem, huh? Yeah, I was going to say so. Fekete really was going back to Menger. I mean, he revers Mises, but he was really going back to Menger and developing his theory. And it's interesting you say it's the time preference theory of interest was Mises. Fekete said if you take Menger and the idea of a bid and offer and apply that to the interest rate, you see there's actually both the productivity and time preference. This was the contradiction that uh, Bob Bauwerk was trying to resolve and that ultimately Mises broke from uh, his teacher, Bob Bauwerk, yeah. over that because he said, no, I'm on the other side and that was a false dichotomy. Um, before Menger... Right, and actually, before Rand, really, there's two theories of value. One says that value is intrinsic. You know, the Bible said that if you, I don't know, kill somebody's ox, then you have to pay this many ounces of silver. Yeah. And, you know, if you take an eye, then the other person takes an eye and this sort of thing. And, um, you know, water is valuable because we need it for human life. And and Menger, Menger shows that's not necessarily the case. And obviously, if you're drowning... Um, more water is not a value at all. In fact, <laughs> it's value. I'd rather have less water right now. Um, and and introduces the idea of, of marginal utility. Right. So I live in in Phoenix. This is a very hot, dry desert. And um, you know, imagine if you're wandering around here in July, temperature can be 115 in the shade easily. So um, it wouldn't take very long before you'd be thirsting to death. Suppose you came across a guy. Um, you know, selling bottled water out of the back of his truck. What would you pay for the first liter of water? You'd empty your pockets. You'd empty your bank account because you're going to be dead if you don't get it. What would you pay for the second? Well, that's a spare to, you know, you know, whatever. What would you pay for the third? Well, by the time you get to the fourth or fifth liter, you actually wouldn't want it. So Menger shows that, and, and it's, not, it's not what they would have used the term objective, meaning intrinsic. It's not that water is necessary because God ordained the universe this way. It's that every good you can have, there's a diminishing value at the margin. Each yeah. additional one is worth less. The only alternative theory offered before Ayn Rand to intrinsic was subjective. And, you know, so if value isn't intrinsic, then it has to be subjective because the law of the excluded middle. And the subjective theory basically throws out all the rules and says anything goes. It's, you know, whatever you feel, man. And the problem is that's <laughs> not really right either, right? You can't eat lead and drink gasoline, right? So that's clearly wrong. And Menger uses the term subjective, but he means it in the sense of methodological individualism. That is, you can't look at an economy and write these equations that purport to, you know, allegedly describe how people are valuing things and quantities demanded and all that sort of stuff. You have to look at the individual. You have to understand the individual's context. And so that's what he's calling subjective. That's what Ayn Rand calls objective. 
neither intrinsic nor subjective. It's a really important point. There's actually three theories of value, not two. Mm -hmm. Both of the classical ones are wrong or not even wrong. And then you get to objective, which means you have to look at the individual. You know, Menger is very careful in how he derives this whole approach. You know, he has the example of the farmer goes to market with a bundle of wheat. And suppose he meets another farmer. If you could say that the value of the wheat was some intrinsic value of whatever one silver coin, then, you know, why wouldn't, why don't you get a trade between the two farmers, both of them having wheat? And the answer is, there's no point, right? Both of them have so much wheat that the value of the margin is diminished. They're looking for somebody else who has something that to them is the first unit. And then to that person, the wheat is the first unit. And so it's very much a, a derivation of why value is objective. He just doesn't use that term. And so once you, once you get that, you realize that, um, He's, he's looking at things from the individual perspective. Now, this, this issue of a priori, there's another false dichotomy there of a priori versus empirical. The empiricists try to just measure general facts about the economy and form a statistic and then try to um, find post hoc relationships. Okay, we find that there's a thousand people. We find that there's 2000 units of grain being sold. And therefore, the ratio of grain to people is two to one or some stupid shit like that. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, okay, that happens to be true at this moment in time for this place. Yeah. But there's nothing that says, you know, I mean, if the paleo diet really takes off, it's not going to be two to one wheat to people. No, it's going to be zero change. to one, right? Wheat is going to go into disuse. People are going to see wheat in museums, but not you know, out of the grocery store, right? So um, uh, what, what uh, the Austrian school is talking about with this a priori is studying man and deriving universal principles of how economics works from the study of man and per Menger from the study of the individual man not, you, you know, the collective of humanity. You know, I think Ayn Rand uses the example of, uh, or, or coins this term, hospitality. Imagine if doctors didn't study, you know, the health of individual patients. They try to study a hospital health as a whole. And, and she <laughs> coins the term, I think she coins the term hospitality. What, yeah. would that, what would that be useful for, right? It wouldn't. It would be useless. And so that's what um, the other schools of economics attempt to do. They attempt to say, well, if this, much money supply and this much GDP growth and, and so on. And, and they're, they're really writing either formulas about nothing or they're really writing formulas on how to centrally plan, which is really the, the real goal, the real cash value of, uh, um, uh, you know, what they do. What I believe I, I read, you call them court economists. <laughs> the court economists. That's right. Cause they're, they're, they're like, term. They're, they're like, you know, people that are just serving the king. Oh, yes, yeah. my Lord, yes, my Lord, you know, <laughs> and it is a revealed truth. <laughs> so the way that I resolve the, the, the contradiction, because I studied Mises far or Mises far more than I did Menger, although I did read the, the principles, but I, I came to the conclusion that Rand is absolutely correct, that in any given set of circumstances, what I pursue, what I obtain either is going to have objective value for me or it isn't. So she was right about that. But on the market, what matters, and it's, it comes down to how you're using the term value, right? Because I can value things that don't have an objective value to me. In other words, I can value the wrong things, right? But on a market, it's what people value that ultimately leads to the prices of you know, goods and services, the objective value of something isn't necessarily going to be indicated in its price, in other words, but the, the subjective valuations that people place on things are what's going to lead to the price. Would you say that that's accurate or inaccurate? Well, I, I was mostly resonating with you until you get into price theory, because I think price theory is not well developed. And I think you have to go back to Menger and bid an offer. And so I do plan to write a book that that presents a, a whole theory of this. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I'm looking uh, forward to it. Um, but um, that's that's some years away right now. I, I'm focused on building a business. <laughs> I, I've got one very ambitious goal there, uh, which is to bring back the, uh, a, gold, a proper gold standard. Um, not a government, you know, forcing gold down your throat at gunpoint. Um, 
But leaving aside the, the formation of the price, because you know whether or not you feel like you like water, everyone needs water, and yet the price of water is dirt cheap. And so uh, you, you really need a theory of price to understand, okay, but water is obviously very abundant. It's much, much more than that. I really cringe when when people say the first rule of economics is scarcity or the first concept of economics is scarcity. Not really exactly right, but obviously water literally falls out of the sky. Water is literally lying around on the ground, um, uh, you know, at least in most parts of the U.S., not here in Phoenix. but um, And it's cheap, even though it's, even though it's needed. I don't think there's any subjective quibbling over whether or not people feel that they need water or at least, you know, add a flavor and call it soda. But, you know, you, you need liquid every day or you're going to die. Um, but yes, it is absolutely true. And Mises, um, you know, pounds home a point that in the market, and, and there's there's a cringeworthy aspect of this too, the consumer is the boss, the consumer is king. Of course, there's no such thing as a sovereign consumer. You only, you know, John Baptiste say said that your demand is your supply. Yeah. You have to be a producer, qua producer, in order to be a consumer, and you're never really qua consumer. Unless it's a welfare state, in which case you're just consuming what someone else produced. Um, and so, you know, but but Mises makes this point that you can sit here as an entrepreneur and say, what I produce is good for people. Now, Rand would say there's no such thing as a good that's done to somebody forced down their throat, either by browbeating them or by literally aiming a gun at their head. That's right. You know, yes, it's true that taking drugs is bad for you, but there's no no good that comes out of the barrel of a gun and forcing people not to do drugs. Um, but similarly, the entrepreneur is going to try to get um, uh, you know pedantic and and browbeat and moralizing and telling you why. You know, uh, was it Thomas Edison invented the phonograph, right? And Thomas Edison really hated the idea that it would be used for mere entertainment purposes. He thought that people would be, you know, it would be like the early version of Coursera um, or, or, or uh, uh, Khan University where people would be learning, you know, be educational materials. And the bottom line is, if you want to be in the record and record player business, you have to sell the product that people want to buy or else they'll just turn to somebody else and you run, you run out of money <laughs> yeah. pretty quick. And so you know, what did people want? They wanted music on records i didn't want lectures on uh you know science or whatever um so in that sense mises absolutely makes a point that everybody needs to get pounded through their through their heads that it's not up to some outside party to say what you should value that's that's up to you and and you could be quote unquote objectively wrong in a philosophical sense but for purposes of how the market's going to evolve you, you know it is what it is deal with it yeah, it's, it's it's irrelevant. So my first interaction with you, I don't know if you're going to remember this, but we were on Facebook and I had said that making an argument for, that economics is necessary to make an argument for a free society. And you responded and you, of course, are correct that morality is the primary argument that needs to be made for a free society. And of course, that's the difference between a, a Mises and a Rand. And I side with Rand. I think that ultimately the idea of individual rights is ultimately, I mean, is totally vital in order to make the case for a free market. A free market is best because it's the moral system, right? But I still think that economics is necessary because of this, because if people don't understand, if you just tell people, look, it's immoral to steal, it's immoral to force people to do things. But if they think that that type of system is ultimately going to lead to their demise, they're not going to support it. So that's why I personally think that economics is necessary. I don't think it's sufficient and I don't think it's the fundamental point that needs to be made in a free for a free society. But I do think that it, it, it's necessary. Do you think so or do you think that economics is totally irrelevant in, in making the case? Well, <laughs> I mean, I'm an economist, right? <laughs> yeah. And I've... I've written thousands of articles comprising millions of words um of a great deal of which is dedicated to either exposing the pathology of what's wrong with our system today which is by the way far more complicated and you know i think most critics of the system and probably most objectivists included 
would just tend to say, well, they print too much money. That's all you need to know at the end. Um, or maybe, well, the reason why we need gold is gold prevents them from printing too much money because you can't print gold, which is sort of facile and it's sort of true, but not in the way, you know. Anyway, so I've written enormous amounts about the pathology of what's gone wrong and what perversities led to it, how much farther back it goes and, um, you know, and everything else. Um, and I've written many, 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 many articles on how a free market and money and credit would work and aspects of how it used to work. But even, even back to the founding of America, it wasn't actually truly free. Um, and, uh, you know, not even close, frankly. I mean, you could open up a restaurant, you could open a farm, you could open up a, it wasn't trucking, but I guess a, a, a carting business with horses and carts. That any business you wanted, you could build ships, you could build buildings without any kind of government permission back in 1790. You wanted to open a bank, you know, you needed a charter from Congress. Yeah. And then Hamilton uh, was instrumental in passing the, you know, the, the free, creating the first bank of the United States, which was a crony institution in every which way you can imagine. Um, and then even in the even in the era of so-called free banking, when they got past this idea of you needing a, a an act of the legislature to, to get permission, um, you know, they were regulated and the regulators imposed all sorts of irrational, unjust requirements in order to open a bank, including generally they wanted you to, if you got a charter at the state level, they wanted you to um, stuff your bank to the gills full of state government bonds as a condition of getting permission to have a bank. And then when the state governments would default, which they did do in those days, um, you know, any bank that had those state government bonds obviously went bankrupt. So, um, uh, what was, uh, I'm trying to remember the topic. I was just trying to make this point on the way to, sorry. You were talking about how most people advocate gold because they think it's as simple as if you get rid of, if you get on the gold standard, you're going to stop inflation, so, but there's more to it than that. Right, the, the study of economics. Anyway, so I've written enormous amounts on what's gone wrong and what, what right would look like. Um, I've written huge numbers of exposes, even of other issues, um, you know, that aren't directly monetary on, on how how the economics and the perverse incentives are working to make everything, you know, every time they they, they pass a reform, you know, things, things, things seem to get worse. So in that sense, of, of course, I think economics is important. How could I not? Um, but to make the fundamental case, um, I, I, which I don't remember the Facebook comment in question, but... To make the fundamental case, ultimately, it has to come down to um, the individual has the right, has certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, property, contract. And, um, you know, I, I do realize it's a hard sell if people think those things lead to poverty and death and that socialism leads to prosperity in life. But then if they think that, they've also missed the point of that rights come from reason and that violating rights is violating somebody, you know, it's preventing somebody from exercising their reason. And how do, why, what makes you think that violating individual people's reason is actually going to get improved outcome? So the point of my dissertation, I mean, I, I made a number of, of um, I, I think, novel and important uh, uh, points in my, in my dissertation, but probably the most important of which was I proved using, uh, I call it the calculus of spreads, but there's a particular kind of analysis I did, that every form of government intrusion, right? And, and government intrusion is always promised to improve outcomes. <laughs> but always, 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 whenever they're doing it, they're saying we're going to get a better outcome than you'd get in a free market. And I looked at probably a dozen different forms of government intrusion. What if they set a price floor? What if they set a price cap? What if they did subsidy and tax, all these different things? And, oh, and proved in each case that they reduced the ability of people to coordinate their productive activities in the economy, that actually outcomes become worse, not better. And you can measure this by looking at spreads getting wider rather than getting narrower. You know, suppose you can, and I always use the example of, you know, buying eggs in a farm town, you know, 50 miles out, outside of the city center. You know, if you can buy eggs for a penny in the farm, you know, 50 miles away, and they're $2 a piece in the city center, there's something very, very wrong that somebody who's built a wall or barrier, you know, government force and stopping people from just going there, fetching the eggs and, sure. and 
it's an arbitrage, right? So they'd be bidding up the price of eggs here, selling, you know, selling them down over here until until this would come up and this would come down, and there'd be just enough of a spread that yeah, you know, some people make money in the egg distribution business. Most people don't really think about how the eggs get there, why the pricing is is, is fair, and so on. So absolutely, I do think that it's important to look at economics um, in light of. So I get I get um, critic, you know, critical comments about my economics articles from both sides, from the objectivists saying you're not overtly discussing objectivism, you're not overtly tying it to reason, and and therefore you know what kind of uh, uh, quizzling are you? I suppose. Um, you know, to put it in really pejorative terms, and from the other side, too much moralizing. You know, you're just an ideologue. You're just an Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand droid ideologue. E- even though I almost never say the word Ayn Rand or objectivism in any of my articles, I'll get that sometimes because I'm talking about the morality of. You, you know, I'll, I'll make the point that if you say you can't trust the individual to conduct his own, decide his own affairs by reason. You're saying that you can trust people to rule, you know, command the affairs of others by force. And just the very contrasting of reason versus force. And some people feel that's both overtly ideological and um, inappropriate, if not wrongful, in any kind of uh, you know, economics you know, work. And um, I find it very interesting what you just said about getting it from both sides, because, you know, I just got out of prison six months ago. So all of these sort of arguments to me, I read in books. I've never actually experienced it. I mean, other than arguing with other inmates and staff members, you know, debating, but the type of stuff that you just mentioned, I never experienced until I put myself out there, you know, doing podcasts, whatever. But I've experienced that same sort of thing where one guy, people, one guy keeps telling me, oh, it's because you're an objectivist. You think this way. And then I had someone else. You're no objectivist. And it's like, <laughs> you can't make anybody happy, I guess. But it's uh, it's just something that's very new to me. So that's why I gave a chuckle when you mentioned it. So so you I, it sounds like so Menger and Rand are the two biggest influences, it seems, that that on your thinking. So do both of them. Because you, you're a, a, like you said earlier, a monetary. I think you said a, you, you got your PhD in monetary economics, maybe, or you said you're a monetary yeah. theorist. Mon- have, monetary science is the term. Monetary idea. science, yes. So, have both of them influenced how you view monetary science, both Rand and Menger? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, having you know, integrated the ideas of objectivism. Um, geez, going on 40 years ago almost, how, how could it not influence, you know, my thought process of everything? Um, and having studied, now my business at this point is the monetary business. It's called Monetary Metals. It has definitely uh, got a monetary goal in mind. Um, you know, again, how could how could my theories of interest and uh, monetary systems not influence something like that? So I would say you know, in forming monetary metals, what came together for me was the unique combination of being an objectivist. If I wasn't an objectivist, I don't think it would be possible to develop this business concept. Um, having studied monetary economics, particularly under Vekete, who adds something, but he, he starts from, he's in the Mengarian tradition, really, um, and then adds his own, you know, flavor to it. Then my business background, having built uh, a software company and sold that, um, what you learn a ton and it's not the kind of things that you get in school um and then finally i guess um you know communications both writing and and uh and speaking in you know, public speaking so i've been through the toastmasters program i highly recommend toastmasters to everybody i highly recommend you know creative writing you know people should write especially if they're interested in intellectual activism which i guess is the uh you know sort of broader theme of your uh, of your channel um so it's those four things it's communications it's economics it's business and it's uh philosophy you know which i see all of those things coming together and, and informing okay this is this is what i want to do this is why i want to do it you know if the world the monetary world weren't failing i would have done another software company right i mean i knew what i was doing in software 
at that point in software business as well as as a as a software developer myself, I had a team that had followed me to hell and back, and they were saying, "Okay, we're ready to jump to the next gig." You know, what what do you what are we doing next? I had access to capital. I had great advisors. Um, you know, tons and tons of ideas. We used to get together a couple of times a week and just brainstorm what would the next software company do? What would it look like? Um, it would have been another software company. I'm I'm in uh, in the finance business because I perceive a problem that I'm trying to correct. And, you know, from Rand, I get it's about free markets. And from Manger, I get, you know, all of the monetary you know, any economic ideas of this is how you go about doing it. There's a quote from Keynes, which I don't know if your readers may be familiar with. Most of the people in the gold space usually are. And it starts out saying there's no surer way to overthrow the capitalist order. Now, that means overthrow civilization, right? Any <laughs> objectors would realize that, you know, if you completely overthrow capitalism and, and expunge the last bits of it, then you collapse into North Korea, which, by the way, everybody would be dead if they weren't getting subsidies from the rest of the world, principally uh, China. They, they wouldn't be alive at all. So it's a complete collapse into barbarism and then ultimately into starvation. The, 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 uh, there's no surer way to... And, of course, Keynes wanted to overthrow the capitalist order. He was a socialist. Um, there's no surer way, over, way to overthrow the capitalist order than by debauching the money. And it goes on and on and on. And when most people just, you know, their eyes glaze at that point, and they assume that what he means is uh, inflation, you know, rising consumer prices. But at the end, he gives it away. That's not what he means at all. Because he says, and it does so in a way that engages all the hidden forces of economics. Today, we'd use the word incentives. So he's talking about we're leveraging incentives in favor of destruction, and not one man in a million can understand what is happening to destroy his world. Now, I'm just old enough to be you know, able to remember the late 1970s. I was 12 years old in 1979. And to say that people, not one in a million, would notice inflation, it's just bizarre. I mean, everybody talked about inflation every day. Mm -hmm. The nightly news always used to have a, the misery index statistic, which is inflation plus unemployment. Everybody was talking about it. You know, my parents would drag me to the grocery store once a week. And um, I, even as a kid, I noticed the price of every grocery item was up every week. Today, everybody's talking about inflation, 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 all day long. To yeah. say that nobody was going to notice it, Keynes was either a, a moron or, or a liar. I don't know what. That's not what he meant. He was talking about lowering the interest rate, which he discusses elsewhere, and also the key to uh, something he was key to do, which is to euthanize the rent here, to kill people that were retired and living on the interest on their savings. He wanted to drive interest to zero. And what Keynes is, is aware of is that if you drive interest to zero, you drive asset prices to infinity because the asset price is the inverse of the interest rate. You drive asset prices to infinity, that's called what? In, in common terms, a bull market. Who could be against bull markets? I've had objectives to say with friends like you, who the hell needs communist enemies? You're against freedom and, and free markets and capitalism. You're against the idea that people are making money in a bull market. I'm like, you don't get it, sir. That's not what my point is at all. That in a free market, you have a stable interest rate. You don't have endlessly rising asset prices. Endlessly rising asset prices is a process of consumption of capital. It's conversion, which is a crime and has, has, has criminal overtones, the cr crime of conversion, an illicit taking of property, right? And, and converting that into somebody else's income. So one person's capital is converted into another's income to be consumed. That's what endless bull markets does in a falling interest rate. That's how Keynes des designed to overthrow our world. And everybody's cheering it because it looks like a bull market. Everybody loves a bull market. And um, very, very perverse. And um, and he's right. Not one million, not one in a million sees it. Not even if you write about it explicitly and put an essay in front of them, then they're like, oh, you're just saying the government always tends to increase its power. No, that's not quite the point that I made. That's a tedious repetition of the point that you've seen over and over and over and over again. No, I made a different point. And um, so uh, I forgot why I got into this whole uh, tangent, but 
it's yes, been it's great. <laughs> I don't remember either, but I think it's wonderful. We were talking about something, but uh, you, but we we're talking. Inflation came up, and then you talked about how Keynes said the best way to debauch the current, the, the overflow, overthrow capitalism was to debauch the currency. And then you were explaining what exactly that meant because it's not just simply print more money and prices rise. And I think when I what it made me think of was, of course, the Mises Hayek theory of the trade cycle, where they talked about the structural problems that end up coming around when you keep the interest rate artificially low. And of course, they predicted the Great Depression, whereas Keynes didn't did not. But before I let you go, I've got to tell you, I read something that you wrote that I found so inspirational. I wish I could remember what you called it, but it was just about, it was about entrepreneurship and you, you talked about your own journey into starting monetary metals and how, when you have an idea, everybody's going to tell you how horrible it is. It's going to fail, <laughs> you're, you know, you're an idiot and everything else. And you, you have to stick with it. And you talked about, you need to get your rest also. You don't want to be starting thinking of sleep as an opportunity cost. But I found it very inspirational. I, I just wanted to tell you that. And so before we go, I mean, the, the inspiration was for Monetary Metals. So what what exactly do you do at Monetary Metals? So we pay interest on gold. Um, oh, that's, that's what I was getting into. Um, Keynes uh, talks about le leveraging the hidden forces, incentives, hidden forces of economics. And the inspiration for Monetary Metals was what if you engage the hidden forces of economics, i.e. incentives, not in favor of destruction, but in favor of trying to get to, to a free market, which is going to fix the problem? Um, you know, what, what would that look like? How do you have to do that? And so if you ask most people, what is it going to take to get gold circulating again as in a gold standard? Well, the mainstream would say, <laughs> you know, you you know, primitive savages, you want to go back to a barbarous relic. Um, they, see, they they disagree with the premise that we should have a gold standard. They think that money means a government printed debt instrument that you're forced to use at gunpoint. And, and they like it that way. And I call them the otherwise free marketers. They can tell you what's wrong with a minimum wage or a tariff or, you know, how restrictive zoning or whatever certificate of need for hospitals. But when it comes to money, they want it to be forced down your throat, and they want it to be irredeemable government debt paper that you use. And the idea that it would be something freely chosen like gold, you know, bothers them. I mean, it, it's offensive to them. Um, but assuming that you accept that uh, uh, people should have the right to choose their form of money, and that, that nobody would choose inflationary paper, um, you know, if they weren't forced to, okay, well, how do you get there? Most of the gold people would say, well, it's just, you know, it's just a matter of price because they're used to confronting when people say there's not enough gold to have a gold standard. And they usually retort, oh, yes, it's just a matter of repricing it, which cha-ching, cha-ching, the dollar signs are lighting up in their eyes, repricing it. It's the same thing the Bitcoin people think. See, here's how this is going to work. First, we buy up all the money. Then we tell the world that the world needs the money. And then the money goes up in price. And then we sell the money for profits. And um, now we're, you know, billionaire fat cats, uh, you know, parceling out the money that only we have. And so they just think, oh, yeah, well, if the price of gold went up enough, then um, gold would circulate. And I'm here to say it's not a matter of price. When gold was 200 and something an ounce, people would have thought at 2000 it would circulate. We hit over 2000. It didn't. It could hit 20,000, get 200,000. That's just the failure of the dollar. That's not going to cause gold to circulate. What's going to cause gold to circulate is interest. I used to, before I founded Monetary Metals, when I gave economics talks, I used to have a slide that had a picture, like a partial picture of a plumbing system. And then you have, you know, you have the pipe here, and then you have this check valve. And when the check valve is parallel to the pipe, the water flows. And when the check valve is turned perpendicular, it shuts off the flow. Mm -hmm. So the interest rate is the is the regulator of flow. And imagine if you had it at a 45 degree angle or 30 degree angle or 10 degree angle, right? That's how much flow you get is interest. It's the interest rate. So let's engage that force of economics that uh, Keynes is, is talking about. Let's offer interest on gold as the way to, um, you know, not yes, it'll be a profitable business, but um, just as importantly, it's a way of achieving 
an ideological end, which is how do we rediscover a free market and money? Because even the even the otherwise free marketers, they can't imagine it. You say free market, and they're like, what? Is it not enough for you that you can go buy and sell bonds on the bond market? And I'm like, buying and selling bonds in exchange for what? It's one form of government credit paper for another. You're saying I have a choice of anywhere I want to sit in the frying pan, and if I don't like the frying pan, anywhere <laughs> I choose to jump into the fire is okay, too. That's not a free market, right? The whole thing is coercive, you know, to its root. And But gold isn't, right? If someone has gold, they don't have to lend it, and they can, they can choose to, but only if they like the terms. Someone has a dollar bill, they're already a lender to the Fed. They put it in the bank, now they're a lender to the bank. They're already funding the banking system and the government whether they like it or not, whether they know it or not. Mm-hmm. So that that was the vision. And um, I think I was talking about, I think we what, what I would like to see in the objectivist community is a, a thousand for-profit businesses, each one of which is tackling a different kind of, of problem of why we don't have uh, you know, a free market today and a free society today and design the business, wow. design the business to offer people a solution to the problems that they're encountering by lack of it being a free market. And look at Uber. I mean, Uber has to be the granddaddy of, of those. They didn't try to form a nonprofit to go lobby the taxi commissions for more permissive taxi regulation, right? They just said, okay, if you got a smartphone, download this app, and this is how it's going to work. And they fixed what people hadn't really thought of as a very, very grave problem. I mean, the taxi experience just sucked. It did. You know, you basically, you know, let's say you're having dinner with some friends. And, you know, now you have to basically leave the warm, comfortable restaurant, go out into the cold, miserable rain, thinking of New York City now, and go all the way to the to the avenue. You know, it could be, it could be 100 or 200 feet away, stand there in the cold, miserable rain, waiting for a taxi to come up. And then, of course, what happens is, you know, taxi's pulling up, some guy comes running up, grabs the door just ahead of you, and now you're waiting another you're 10 screwed, minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And so now you just, you know, punch in your, you say, I want to, I want to ride. Here's where I want to go. And uh, you can see the map of where the car is and you don't have to get up from the table and, you know, conversation with good friends and told the things at the door. And then you, then you leave and you get in the car and don't get wet and don't get cold. And they just made things significantly better. And now governments just have to have to reckon with Uber as the thing. You can't really ban it. It is what it is. There it is. And the world is a better place for it. And I'd like to see a thousand, uh, not necessarily objectivists, but a thousand businesses that are targeted towards making something freer by disrupting their industry, or their market in a, in a unique way. That's a targeted vector, right? Aimed at how do you how do you, you know, drive change into the world, the, the change that you want to drive. And that's that's what Monetary Metals is trying to do for the for the monetary system. That is awesome. Okay, Dr. Wiener, where can people find you? So on uh, Twitter, I'm at Real Keith Wiener. Um, our website is monetary metals.com. Most of my writings are there. I also have a personal blog where sometimes I post things that are, um, you know, not related to monetary economics, other economic things called Keith Wiener Economics.com. All right, people go to it. It's good stuff. Thank you very much for coming on with me today, Dr. Wiener. For now, this is The Rational Egoist. I'm Michael Leibowitz signing out. Remember, like, share, comment, subscribe. Till next time.